uh, you, you, you didn't comment too much on ISIS. Uh, what's their role in their caliphate uh, through Iraq and Syria? That's an excellent question. The <coughs> caliphate is in an area, they control uh, one city, Raqqa. Mm -hmm. They control an area just uh, outside of the Palestinian refugee camp in Damascus. It's called Yarmouk, and we heard a lot of terrible propaganda about that for a while. But ISIS is like just next door, uh, but right now Yarmouk is uh, under Syrian control. And um, it's not <coughs> safe, though, with ISIS next door. So uh, ISIS is in an area that's completely surrounded by desert. The Syrian government controls the city of Deir Ezzor, where the U.S. bombed them, uh, bombed the Syrian army just recently. Uh, they killed 100 soldiers. <coughs> that were like, they're protecting an airport that they used to bring supplies in for the people of Deir Ezzor. And the, uh, and ISIS is like in a ring around them. In other words, the only access that the Syrian army has to there is from the air. <clears throat> and yet they have soldiers stationed there protecting the city of Deir Ezzor. And um, ISIS, I think, is something of a non-starter at the moment. If they, uh, their, the Iraqi government is talking about getting them out of Mosul, which will be interesting to see if they can do that. Uh, and in Syria, really, they're the big bubble. <coughs> There's a reason the United States is, says it's there. The United States has never attacked ISIS in Syria. They watch, <coughs> they watch the truck <coughs> go from Mosul, the weapons, the U.S. weapons that they took from Mosul, <coughs> They watched the caravan from the sky take those weapons to Raqqa in Syria. And then they watched them go to Palmyra and destroy Palmyra. The Syrian government saw them coming from the ground and removed the population. So I think there were very few casualties there. And uh, they... Uh, demined the place when they took it back, so they think they can put together a lot of the stuff that's broken. But ISIS, the United States, uses ISIS as a reason to be there. I'm not going to comment. There's so much uh, discussion about how ISIS came to be. But the United States wrote a report on al-Qaeda in Iraq, the U.S. military. This, I can, that's another thing I can provide you with. It's on my blog. They wrote a couple of reports. Uh, in 2007 and 2008, they took over uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq's uh, main base, and guess where it was? It was on that same mountain, Sinjar Mountain, where the Yazidis got attacked when they first started uh, there. Yes. The United States, that's been their base all along. And uh, the United States found a bunch of papers there, and they were, you know, evaluating them. And one is that, um, showing all the fighters that were coming in were uh, bringing money. And the other was to show that the suicide bombers usually had larger amounts of money than the rest on them because they came as like gifts from Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or wherever they came from, uh, money and a body. And uh, they also found that um, the network of, uh, in Syria that they were coming through, they were coming from Turkey through Syria, and that it was a criminal network, not a Salafist network. In other words, these weren't believers bringing them into Iraq. They were uh, criminals, and that's why it was kind of below the government's level of uh, noticing, because they're like, you know, crime is everywhere, corruption, and that's not their first concern. So that's where, uh, so it was actually one of the documented things at the end of this uh, paper that was written was like, we ought to investigate this. This could be useful. A way to bring fighters into Syria. And guess what? I guess they did use it. And that was ISIS. Because that the ISIS, or the uh, Islamic State, is uh, what used to be al-Qaeda in Iraq. The leadership is. So uh, this isn't even the 2012 paper where they said, gee, they might start their own Salafist entity and take away part of Syria and Iraq. Hmm. What about that? United States wrote it down, nobody did anything. This is uh, the U.S. response to what's happening there. So you can question if they were instigating it or if they just, you know, were ignoring it. 
I don't know. But they definitely uh, were aware of the networks of how to bring the people in. Yes? Um, I think Mr. Assad's real crime is, I don't know if he's a dictator or not. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But his, the United States has a long history of supporting dictators who <laughs> dance to their tune. Ask the Filipinos, ask the Indonesians, ask the Nicaraguans. The United States supported dictatorships in all those countries for a long time that did their bidding. Bashar al-Assad's real crime is that he refused to dance to the U.S. tune. That's what he, that was what was wrong with him. Well, the United States wanted to, or tried to use the smoke screen of the Arab Spring, which was probably a good thing, because it overthrew their favorite dictator in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak. They tried to use the smoke screen of the Arab Spring to get rid of someone that they didn't want because he refused to dance to the U.S. tune. And another thing I would like to say about this is this is a repeat of exactly what happened in Afghanistan when we overthrew a legitimate government who happened to be socialist. We overthrew them. We gave money to the, oh, what were they called? Mujahideen. The Mujahideen. And one of the groups in the Mujahideen was the Taliban. Well, we gave them money, we supported them, and then when, then when the government was overthrown, the Taliban gained control, and what did we do several years later? We had to go in and overthrow the Taliban. Well, I, I'd like to respond actually to one point about that, which is that Turkey, and I predicted this a long time ago, uh, I shouldn't take pride in it since uh, I like being right, but this was not something to be happy about, is that um, Turkey is now suffering the same fate as Pakistan, which is that the um, uh, these militant organizations, these <coughs> fighters, I've been asked not to use the term militant because that means like, you know, union workers or something. Uh, these these uh, mercenaries and salafists and all kinds of people that are there right now, people who have never done anything but fight. They came from Chechnya, they came from uh, areas of the world where wars have been before, from, from uh, Afghanistan, and um, they're, they live in Turkey now. And Turkey's having all kinds of bombings and uh, <coughs> terrorist attacks, and you know, and that's what happened in Pakistan too, uh, when they supported the United States, when they facilitated that policy, same policy for the United States, and it's it's very sad, and um, only the people of the region, I think, can really uh, fix it because outsiders, foreigners. For one thing, they can't tell who's who. They can't tell a Syrian who just kind of bungled into it from somebody from Al Qaeda who's a diehard whatever. You know, they uh, have the wrong expectations. That's why the drone program fails so terribly because they see people doing very simple, ordinary things, and they build them into oh my God, you know, this is you know some horrible thing, and, and they kill a whole bunch of people who haven't done anything, and because uh, they don't know the difference. You really cannot tell. So if this problem is going to be solved, it has to be solved by the people who are there and who can talk to each other and who understand the social signals of what's going on. And I really fear for this country because we have our own seething, angry people. And, if, and they are, in many cases, far more oppressed than the people of Syria who... Uh, you know, joined the so-called revolution. And uh, if there was a war, it would be really bad and we wouldn't like it. And, uh, you know, because war isn't the solution. It isn't the solution to any of the problems. Amen. Could you just give us a little background about the, the motivations for U.S. Uh, wanting regime change in Syria? Oh, sure. And, and the origin of the sanctions. <coughs> the origin of what? The sanctions. Oh, the sanctions. And, and how was the U.S. Man how did the U.S. manage to impose those sanctions when Syria has allies like Iran and Russia? Well, uh, I mean, the U.S. has imposed sanctions on Iran and Russia, too. The Syrian sanctions are old. Syria has been under sanctions off and on for decades. And... Um, 
<coughs> Bashar Assad, and this was true actually of Saif al-Islam, uh, Gaddafi's son, they went to school in the UK and they loved it. <laughs> they liked the people. They liked the culture. They thought, wow, we want to bring some of this home because our people could have fun and, you know, be happy and rich too. And, um, you know, they really did. They, they were like, wow, this is, you know, this is way cool. Uh, our people could live better too. And they went back and in uh, well, Saif al-Islam's case, he convinced his father to like make a sort of halfway turn. But in Bashar Assad's case, you know, he married a woman who grew up in the UK. She was Syrian and he had known her as a child, but she grew up in the UK and she studied uh, business. And so they had ideas about, you know, building a more open society. And, you know, they have a two, this, all these small impoverished countries that the US has been leaning on for decades. Um, they have two choices, austerity or sanctions. They have two choices, either you're with us or you're the enemy. And so these guys, these younger men, they're quite a bit younger than me, they were like, <coughs> well, maybe we can tolerate a little bit of austerity, because we're already under sanctions anyway, and then we can re, you know, we can join the world, think about that, you know, we can have contacts with this great interesting place uh, in the West, and our people will benefit. And that was one of the, actually Bashar Assad's uh, two big uh, agendas, but his biggest one was education, actually, in Syria. And uh, the, uh, so they backed down a little. But then the U.S. said, huh, well, geez, since you're our friend now, I think, you know, we're going to ask our big question. We'd like to put the uh, pipeline from Qatar through Syria and have it go all through Israel. And then Syria will get a pittance and Israel and Qatar will make a fortune off of this. And he said, well, actually I had another plan. I said, Iran and Iraq are going to send oil through and we can work together and uh, we're going to send it off our own coastline. Or maybe we'll be generous and send some of it through Lebanon. So Lebanon's not so impoverished. And from that time on, they said, you know, they started setting it up. They spent... Uh, the State Department admitted they spent like $5 million in the five years before this war began in Syria building up the pro-democracy forces that would fight this war. $5 million. They, uh, there was a drought. <coughs> and people have said, well, it's global warming that did this to Syria. Well, I suppose, but, you know, Turkey has an upstream dam on the Euphrates. And they kept taking their full share of water out of the dam. So Syria and Iraq had an even more diminished water supply than if they had, uh, you know, than if it had been evenly distributed, fairly redistributed. So, uh, and then Israel had the Golan. Well, the Golan is mountain water. Almost all of Iran's water comes from mountains like that. And um, it was a, a source of water for the whole area at the base of the mountains there. And uh, Israel took every drop and turned it back into Israel. They made fancy parks, they built swimming pools, they trucked it back into Israel, you know, they piped it back into Israel for whomever. And uh, Syria completely lost that supply of water. So there wasn't just a drought. There was international forces. I think that's something in the United States there are some issues, but because our country is one country, no state could do that to another. But what if they could? You know, places upstream on the wrong river or, you know, downstream on the wrong river could be choked and uh, poisoned. Yes? Um. I had a question and a follow-up. Um, you, you mentioned uh, at one point um, Syrian Kurdistan, mm -hmm. uh, where, for the record, the U.S. has carried out airstrikes against ISIS a number of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I wondered what, what your thoughts are on um, the Kurdish Democratic Union Party's uh, Democratic Confederalist peace proposal that was uh, shut out of the talks in Geneva by both the U.S. and Russia. Well, and... Um well, they shut it out for different reasons. Okay. 
occurred. The U.S. just controls the Kurds. And uh, Russia shut it out because uh, it would be divisive for Syria to have, uh, and it would be very dangerous actually with Turkey having so much hostility to the Kurds if you <coughs> gave Kurds a separate uh, plan. So the Kurds, not just their peace plan. That's not what the proposal says, though. I don't know what the proposal says, but I know that the Kurds themselves were shut out of the conference. I guess I want to go there. The Kurds themselves were shut out. And that's because Turkey, it would upset Turkey. That's why the United States did it. And Russia just, I asked, actually this is one of the questions I actually asked uh, uh, Bashar Assad, is uh, what about the Kurds in uh, northern Syria? Like originally, they were fighting with the government, and you were providing a lot of their supplies. And at some point, the U.S. took over, and there was that whole Kobani scene. And I might add, you know, this is how I see Kobani. It's a city the size of Binghamton, okay? It's not very big. And they bombed it, laid waste for it completely, after most of the people were gone. The ISIS had a small contingency of forces there fighting. The United States had a small contingency of their air power, their uh, bombing. And the Kurds were fighting for their city and their lives. They were used. Because at some point, why did the battle end? Because the United States and ISIS got tired of being there and they quit. And they went away. But there was nothing left. There was nothing to have at that point. And uh, the, um, you know, from a strategic viewpoint of a war, the United States never had enough invested in Kobani to call it a major interest, and neither did ISIS. And only the Kurds did. But the Kurds went with the United States, and this is what I asked them about. I said, what about all this stuff about independence and stuff? At one point, they were so, they seemed happy to be with the Syrian government. They had all received, some of them didn't have citizenship because they had emigrated from Turkey like a generation ago. And, uh, they were given citizenship. That was the other thing that happened in 2012. And um, he said that, um, yes, there's YPG forces in Kurdistan who, uh, who are the immigrant uh, Turkish Kurds that had come there uh, fleeing the Turkish army uh, over the last, say, 50 or 70 years. But there were also Kurds that were indigenous to Syria and had lived there for generations and generations and generations, going back into antiquity. And that, as far as they were concerned, they're Syrians. And like, uh, the uh, director of Damascus University is a Kurd. My friend that went there with us, her father's a, a, you know, a successful uh, Damascus businessman, is a Kurd. Um, they were integrated with society. But the YPG forces, are uh, still like in that state of um, thinking about trying to have independence. And they were the ones that were the most fierce fighters, so the U.S. Uh, actually worked with them and promised them independence, but what's happened, the U.S. has betrayed them. And I was in Iraqi Kurdistan for a month, uh, like in 2009. These people have been betrayed over and over and over again. And uh, their governments are not democratic. They might seem on the surface to have some of the trappings of democracy. And the women aren't free either, although there's changes there. And yes, they do fight in the wars. Uh, the women there, there's a lot of uh, genital mutilation. is a common practice in those areas. And it's just now uh, that there are people within their own society trying to change that and succeeding slowly. But it's a, it's a veneer to say, oh, the Kurds are more democratic and westernized than the Arabs. It's just not true. They are largely a rural population, sort of a, and living on hard scrabble farms and uh, in small communities. And especially in Iraq, not so much in Syria actually, but in Iraq. And they're very isolated. And then they were treated so horribly and when I was there, everything they had either came from the Iranian Kurds or from the Syrian Kurds. They had nothing from the rest of the world, nothing from the U.S., except for people buying oil so that they would defy uh, the, the uh, uh, 
Iraqi government. So I think uh, the way the Kurds are presented is A, uh, not, uh, not accurate, and B, it's not in their interest because it's not helping them if you like, you know, elevate them so they'll fight for you and then turn on them when a bigger ally, you know, comes along. And that is what's happened, and it's happened in Iraq more than once to the Kurds who live there. Because the United States has been in that mix for a long time. They were the major backers of Saddam Hussein when he came to power. So this is why we need to demand that our country leave the region and take our allies with us. And I mean, they cannot say that they don't have any control of Saudi Arabia and It's just ridiculous. Every weapon those people have came from us. Every penny they have came from us. The oil companies that they thrive on and that they're now using to uh, sort of do a smash of the international uh, eco economy is theirs because they made an agreement with the United States that they would never trade oil in anything but dollars. And so that keeps the dollar uh, supreme, except that the United States never really thought that, hey, uh, Iran might be selling oil in rubles, or, you know, uh, Russia selling oil in rubles. Yes? Or euros. Um, <clears throat> well, I wish you would comment on this. It's not exactly a question. But at 5 o'clock this afternoon, I read that article on Counterpunch by Diana Johnstone. Mm -hmm. And the point she makes is uh, not exactly stated outright. But the objective of the United States is to make sure there is no government in, Syria. in the Middle East yeah. that is big enough and strong enough to oppose it. And you know, the ultimate objective is just to destroy it all our objective there is chaos. Well, I think there's we a certainly don't. We certainly don't want to have a secular government or a democratic government over there. We love military dictators, and we want that oil. That's right, and and I totally, I totally agree. Uh, that well, I don't totally agree. I think that that's one scenario, and it's probably their favorite. And it's been stated many times. It's been stated by Israelis as well as Americans. Uh, but uh, so that's one. Um, that's one thing to think about, and uh, it, that's what they did to Libya. Yeah. Libya is totally destroyed. There's nothing. Can you imagine, like, if some, somebody started a war here, if the Martians came to Earth and started a war in the United States that left us all governed by Tea Party militias? <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. It, 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 what would we, you know... Uh, how would we survive? So I, I just, um, I forgot your name now, um, um, uh, Mr. Oscar, uh, yes. He's, uh, yeah, awesome. awesome. Thank you, I forgot, I'm sorry. My name is Basin. I am so proud for you. You are from Rajasthan representative. How we love the peace and justice for the rest of the people in the whole world. <coughs> and I am so happy you come back safety. And nice to hear you. And thank you for the information you give to the American people to let them wake up. You know, because a lot of people in this country, honestly, they don't know nothing. They don't know that from <coughs> And I'm so sorry. Like you said, Syria was a beautiful country, good government, good. The people so much happy. Yes, the people, I mean, I have just come. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. No, the I The people just <coughs> the peaceful rejection to make change some kind in the government. Nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, I am as Palestinian American and I live for 45 years in this country. When mm -hmm. I came to this country, I will speak, I wish America teach our leaders back home how to be run in democracy, democratically, you know? Mm -hmm. But like the gentleman, he said, yes, American government, they insisted to have dictator and bad leaders and that <coughs> to do whatever they want. Anyway, they start peacefully. But the people, and it's good, nothing wrong with that. Everybody have right to do something, you know. But the problem is, if we really against the terrorists, and uh, our President Bush, he go back there to fight after September 11, because we can get ready from the terrorists, fight them, get ready from them. ISIS, they are same 
terrible situation. I believe if American government interested to have peace for the all Syrian people, yes, they will work together, Russia and America, to fight sincerely and get rid of from these sick people, the ISIS, whatever they call them, mm -hmm. and give choice to the Syrian people mm -hmm. to work with each other, and they have their own, you know, vote and this, and then they have their own right. that, government. That, yes. I think this is the best way if we really American government interested to help the Syrian people. Mm -hmm. That's my point. And another thing, now we have so many refugees. I feel so much sorry for them. Um, we got to help these people, no matter what. But not to help them and let them stay away from their country. We should help them until we let their country settle, then we send them back to their country. Well, if they want to go back, and they should have a place to go to. I yes. agree. I, you know, I think that, um, I guess my feeling is that some of these governments, and I think Bashar Assad is less um, less oppressive or whatever you want to call it than his, than his father, and that <coughs> they're slowly, people, you can't impose democracy. People have to build it. They have to be safe to build it. And that was starting to happen in Syria. And now we've destroyed everything. And that is the sad thing. And it's, uh, you know, um, I hope that they can hold together and, and find a way out of this. And it will help, and I certainly hope that somehow we can restrain our government from doing anything worse than it's already doing because it's a, a real possibility and it's really frightening. Another comment, if you don't mind. Okay. You know the Palestinians, they have refugees for 70 years. Yeah. And nobody want to fix their problem until That's right. now. But we're not supposed to have a big lesson from this problem. And the whole idea, believe me from my heart, not I, I you know, I speak the truth. I'm, I'm never afraid. I'm afraid from God only from Allah. But I believe when I came to this country, I have a message in my heart. I have to talk to the American people. All the mess we see just because Israel. Um, and you know, I have a lot of good friend, Jewish people, they are the best. We, uh, we could live with each other, Christian and Muslim and Jew together. Mm -hmm. But the whole mess you see in the Middle East, just for two things, the oil and security for Israel. To let Mr. Netanyahu do whatever he want, he have a right to do it, no problem. But the other leaders, they are criminal. But he is superman. <laughs> <laughs> because American Congress welcome him. And the American president, he can say nothing if he come at this. And where this, did Netanyahu uh, go to school, Basim? Where did he go to school? Here. That's where he got his education. His father was a professor of Middle Eastern studies at Cornell for a long time. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> so sorry, I had a follow up from earlier. Um, so yeah. a, f a few months ago, uh, when. Uh, in Kobani and a handful of other places that, as you mentioned, were really, really bombed out. Um, they started rebuilding schools mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of those areas, and the new uh, sort of way they've been running the schools there included, for the first time in decades and decades, um, teaching in Kurdish, right. and teaching Kurdish language right. uh, studies. And a few months ago, in, in response to that, the Assad government, which had been, uh, which had been supporting some of the civilian infrastructure, uh, in Kurdistan still, uh, stopped paying the salaries for all of the teachers in the schools well, as retaliation I, I for, don't know for that teaching they in Kurdish. So I, I, I just wonder what, like, I don't know, just your, your thoughts on that? I mean, I, 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 I don't, to be honest, I don't know the details, so I don't have too strong a comment. Um, a few months ago, the war is raging right now. The YPG, which is not really, which is causing problems for the Syrian government, is uh, and is being held up as a model of being better than Syria, uh, is uh, asserting itself. 
And so I'm not sure what happened or who, who made the decision either, because I don't think that Bashar Assad makes all the decisions. Oh, I'm sure but, it's not him. Um, but somebody did. And, um, but I will say this about the Kurdish language, okay? Um, there is very little written in Kurdish, except for poetry and a few nice novels, and it's beautiful. Uh, the uh, Syrian and Turkish Kurds speak a different version of Kurdish than the Iraqi and uh, uh, Iranian ones. And they write, one, the Iraqis and Iranians write in Arabic script, and the Syrians and uh, Turkish ones, uh, I guess some of the Syrians might use the Arabic script if they're deep in Syria, but uh, they use the Turkish uh, letters. Uh, to have an education beyond grammar school in Kurdish would be very challenging. And my friends in Kurdistan had a school, and they had textbooks uh, printed in uh, Iran. They had to practically create them themselves. And it was only for like K through seven. Uh, but here's something that reminds me of, again, India and Pakistan. When the British uh, wanted to be divisive, uh, they, they needed to get it so that the Muslims would not have power anymore. And the language of the state was uh, Farsi, the uh, Iranian language, because of the previous empires. So by breaking that, the British said, we're setting you free to use your own language to the, to the Indians. It created divisiveness with the Muslims, and it made English the language of state. Okay, and in Kurdistan, what would have to happen if they really didn't learn any Arabic, aside from not being able to talk to their neighbors, they would have to have another language to study higher studies in, and that would become English instead of Arabic. I mean, isn't that up to them, though, and isn't cutting off money for teaching in Kurdish? Well, in America, English? are you allowed to have schools in Spanish? What? In America, can you have schools where only Spanish is taught? So I went to a bilingual school that taught Spanish. All right, bilingual. So bilingual is good. They're not teaching just in Kurdish. They added Kurdish. Did they? I mean, see, I don't know that. I, mean, I don't know the answer to that question. But I know it's a big issue in Iraqi Kurdistan, and it's a big problem because essentially it puts English in the place of Arabic as the language that gives depth to their ability to reach out. And um, for the Kurds, it's very isolating because they're locked in there between Turkey, who hates them, <laughs> and uh, the Arab countries. So I don't know the particulars, but I'm just giving you that as an overview of what some of the issues are. And I have no idea it could be anybody in the, Syri in the Syrian government who withdrew the salaries, plus which the government can't pay anybody's salary right now. I mean, you know, they were paying, you know, uh, really, they were paying for the grain in, in Raqqa and the uh, oil workers in places and stuff, and, and uh, doctors in these hospitals are supposedly bombing. They're paying the doctors. So, and the schools, the teachers in the schools are supposedly bombing. So it's real hard to tell what's really going on. Judy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, you know, somebody asked about what, what's the importance of Syria, you know, to the United States? Well, there's one thing that we forget sometimes, that Syria is a very strategic country, and it's called a border, borderline, or what, if, what do they say? It? It's a frontline state. Because it, it, it kind of borders the, it, Israel. It borders Israel. And that is very, very strategic. Because one thing that this, the fact that it does border uh, Israel affects really the history of Syria, no matter what. It, everything that goes, through, goes on in that region, the history, their, their history and what have you, because they become really an object of tremendous pressure from, from, you know, from the United States and from the Zionist state of Israel. And that's really, really a, a very important issue to, to remember. The fact that there is an alliance, it also with Iran, and there's an alliance with Hezbollah, and there's an alliance with another group that I can't remember. Uh, 
So that's important <coughs> that the Zionist state of Israel is really very much contained. And it links the, the Syrian, the fate of the Syrian people to really <coughs> to the struggle of the Palestinian people. Just no doubt to that. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm here tonight is uh, I noticed a pattern of uh, news reports and uh, they'd be about uh, Syria, but they'd be from outside of Syria. So I, I'd like to know what uh, news people are doing a good job of reporting something close to the truth from Syria and are actually on the ground uh, in Syria so that they can maybe hear from both sides. And I'm now hearing maybe from five or six sides. Uh, and uh, who is good at making peace and what are their techniques? Well, I think they have organizations that are at least trying to make peace. And like I say, they're grassroots, so it's a slow process. You're working with little groups of people and trying to spread it. But uh, as far as the reporting goes, the United States are unwilling to report on what's going on in the country of Syria, in the uh, government-held areas, which I would call the country of Syria. And um, it's too dangerous to send reporters into uh, the other areas. So essentially, they're only reporting on behalf of the areas that uh, it's too dangerous to send anyone into. So yeah, they're all reporting from the outside. And these um, activists and members of the, you know, different militias are actually doing their own reporting. And then people are scooping it up on the outside in Turkey and Istanbul and in Lebanon uh, and Beirut and wherever. And then they're sending reports over to us. And they're doing it with a very strong U.S. bias with all the issues that I mentioned about these really negative assumptions about Muslims and about Arabs. Are there things that can be done to keep the reporters safe? Uh, I in, don't... Including disguising them and keeping them sort of secret? In, well, there in, are people who have gone over there. There's a guy named Todenhofer, a German uh, war reporter, who interviewed one of the top guys in... Um, Al Nusra, Al Qaeda in Syria, uh, and it's on the blogosphere all over the place right now. Uh, I think the first place I saw it was Moon of Alabama because Bernard is uh, Germany translated it. Um, but uh, basically, he uh, <coughs> the guy said, "Yeah, we get all our weapons from the Americans, <laughs> and uh, they're our main supporters." and uh, but um, there's people marching in the streets going, we hate Americans. And there's this one story that I thought just tells it all. Uh, the Turkish military came down into the city of Rai, R-A-I, and in Syria, which was a pretty horrible thing to do. They invaded Syria illegally. And they came down in there to make a space, their safe zone. And so the Americans said, we want to help you. And so they send in um, a few hundred um, special ops guys to work with them. Well, when the special ops guys got there, there was a bunch of so-called moderate uh, rebels there for them to work with. And these guys had a fit. And it's actually in a video, because they video themselves all the time. And they were screaming at these guys, get out of here, we don't want you and we don't need you. <coughs> and um, they were, and it was uh, decided that one particular group made this happen. So they actually drove the Americans out and they actually backed off and left because there was all these guys, you know, like swinging guns at them and stuff and screaming at them. So they went, backed off, and um, they reported. And so the United States decided which group it was. They listed them as a terror, they added them onto the terrorist list. <laughs> and then they went and they bombed the village where they're bunkered. And then a day later, they sent their bodies right back into rain, into the city of rain, and this time they were received. And they were welcomed. So uh, this, this is the kind of war America is fighting there. I mean, that is just beyond. Hello. Yes, Elaine. So uh, I, I don't think that I was aware of the kind of sanctions that, that I wasn't you, either. you have described. Yeah. 
But as you described them, they reminded me so much of, number one, the, the sanctions that we imposed on Iraq mm -hmm. in which we killed, we were responsible for the, for the deaths of so mm -hmm. many children. Mm -hmm. And of course, the sanctions in Gaza, that the, you, called, you called this a siege. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what Gaza is under. They are under a siege that sounds so much like what you described in, in Syria. And I'm and I guess I'm just thinking the power of our nation with our tax dollars to wreak such destruction in that part of the world. And it's not just that part of the world, but that part of the world. And we just stand by, sort of helpless. Yeah. So thank you for going there, Judy. And thank you for bringing back what you saw. Well, I, it was an amazing opportunity for me. I have to tell you, it was an unforgettable uh, trip. Yes? Um, I keep thinking about the complexity of your talk vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the binary simplicity of the media and the, that we hear every okay. constantly. Mm -hmm. So my question is, does it matter? Does the election matter? <laughs> um, I mean, I mean let, let's assume Clinton is elected. Um, How will it matter? It certainly won't help Syria. No, a I, I, my feeling, and I'm not going to vote in this election, well, I might vote for Joe Stein, just to be uh, a participant of some kind, but in some ways I would say that Clinton is more of a danger to Syria than Trump. But Trump is more of a danger to us. <laughs> you know, but, you know, if she starts World War III, that might, you know, even that might be beyond it. So I don't know. I, I honestly, I, I fear for this country, and especially with the stuff that's happening on the streets now and this horrifically you know, do we have a democracy? How can we spread democracy if we don't have one? I don't think we have one. Republic. Uh, uh, um, black and if Clinton is elected, let's assume that she has always taken a more right-wing position on a lot of things, on Syria and on um, Libya, than Barack Obama was when she was Secretary of State. Um, but there's another thing that gentleman I think has left, but um, Kurdistan is a nation that covers the area of four nations. It, it's, I've read Kurdistan it's, isn't a nation, it's a community. Well, it's a community. But it's but not it's, technically a nation, I don't think. Well, it, 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 I've seen that it's the largest ethnic group in the world that does not have a nation. Right, it doesn't have a nation. Have a nation. Yeah. They cover four countries. Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Now, the United States is probably supporting the Kurds in the in Syria because you know it wants to create division there. They support the, the Kurdish Peshmerga in northern Iraq, and they probably support the ones in Iran. Or I haven't heard anything about that. But they don't support the Kurds that are in Turkey because Turkey is a major NATO ally of the United States. So. When Turkey crushed um, the, the, Kurdish, the Kurdish Workers' Party back in the 80s and 90s, the United States didn't say a damn thing well, because <coughs> Turkey is their NATO ally. But if, if um, Assad were to do that in, to Kurds in Turkey, well, how hell would break? Well, it is breaking loose. Well, but the thing is, is uh, what's happened in Syria right now, you know, is nothing compared to what. Uh, Turkey did to the Kurds, <laughs> and, 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 and Turkey, I just can't believe it, before the election, for some reason, even, even activists in this country and writers, even the ones that I respect, never mentioned this, before the most recent election when uh, Erdogan was elected, uh, re-elected, he went out and massacred Kurds all over the south of the country to undermine the party that was his opposition. He, he, the terrorists, which was probably ISIS people that he allowed into the country, set off uh, bombs and car bombs and suicide bombers in Istanbul and Ankara. They 
and all of this was under his control. And he, he's not a democratically elected leader either. He's a, somebody who, <coughs> you know, threatened people to the point where there was no one left who would run against him. And I must say that I haven't seen anything quite like that in Syria in a long time. And, uh, you know, meaning decades, not a couple of years. Paul. Oh. Um, I may make just two quick comments about um, reference to the, the elections going on here. It, it, <coughs> one thing is that it's, I've watched my share that we, I get kind of intrigued with the level of lies that are promoted. So I, I would assume that we can take as a given that most of what we hear about U.S. policy in the Mideast from government sources is a lot. And I, I think that we forget that or, or we, we, you know, we forget it. You know, we, we want them to tell us the truth and, and deep down I think we're beginning to understand most of what we hear is a lot. And we know that the media doesn't, geez, I should have asked them, geez, you know, we didn't call them, you know, whatever. The second thing that struck me is what's going on is that an incredible number of people in this country show their anger about how they experience this country by supporting Trump. And I think the peace movement has to get in touch with its anger. I, I think that we have anger, but we don't know what to do with it or how to move it forward. They need to so, become militant, not well, terrorists, I but militant. We have to acknowledge that this, what we see and the lies we hear can create great anger in us, and I think we've got to figure out how to put it into motion. I and, and I think this, uh, supporting you in the work that you do, that the WikiLeaks people do, the, the Assangers, the Democracy Now!, there are frontline people out there. We need to honor them. We need to support them with our dollars. We need to stand up and say that's a lie whenever we hear a lie, whether it's from the police department or uh, an elected Foreign election. policy, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Because, uh, and we need to, like, a lot of times people will stand up and say that's a lie, but their ideas are still colored by it about the, the target of the lie. They say, well, maybe there's a grain of truth. You know, well, there's a grain of truth. There's a little something negative in everybody. But the reality is there's nothing worthy of the level of lies that they're telling. And I don't know... But I think uh, there are national organizations that I know uh, that are going to come up with some kind of campaign sometime very soon. And I hope that people here will be aware of it and interested in hearing about it because I think we need to, I agree with you, Paul, I think we need to show our anger and we need to rein in our government, you know, because uh, it's using our resources to wreak havoc all over the world and on poor people here too, on black people, on Native Americans, on, and on the rest of us now too. <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it's just so frightening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you touched on the white helmets before, and right now I think they're, they're one of the main <coughs> organs of propaganda that is being used to whip up what, what amounts to a very dangerous situation of war. Um, they they propose that they are an independent, non-governmental organization that gets no financing from any government, um, and that they're some kind of you know first responders. Uh, like you said, they're they're being recommended for Nobel Peace Prize, and there's a film on Netflix which idolizes them, and NBC has praise them as angels and everything else. And we need to really, uh, and maybe you could expand on this a little bit, uh, how all that is an utter, complete lie. It's fabricated. And we just, uh, because the United States government, the AID, gives them 23 million. The British Foreign Office gives them 19 million. The Germans are giving them a lot of money. The Dutch are giving them a lot of money. Well, this is what I want to say, though. All these, I don't know how they can even present them because right on their website it says that they're independent, they don't take any money from governments, and all these governments admit that they do give them money. So it's not even a secret. It's, it's like 
the lie is right out there in plain sight. You don't even have to do any research. All you got to do is look at their website and listen to Mark Toner to speak for the State Department once in a while. And there it is, in plain sight. So I don't know how, uh, and the fact that they, uh, I think the biggest lie and the one uh, that most confuses people is, and I've had people say, uh, I, and they wanted to argue with me, and I, I can't even argue about it, like, no, there are not the same number of people in East Aleppo as in West Aleppo. There are not the same number of people in uh, government-held territories as in uh, uh, occupied or uh, uh, opposition-held territories, whatever you want to call them. There are not the same number of people there. We're talking at most a couple of million versus almost 20 million. So it's when you see it that way, you start to see that, hmm, I'm missing a big piece of the story. And that is the thing that people don't quite, can't quite wrap their minds around, that there's a big hole that they don't know anything about. And as long as they stay in that little world, all the fantasies work. But as soon as you put into place, the elephant comes into sight in the room, you go, oh, that doesn't make any sense at all. And that is what is not happening. Um, speaking of the media, was the media contacted here in Rochester about this event tonight? Uh-huh, yeah. Well, where are they? Oh, well, they're where they always are. You know, <laughs> Channel 8, Channel 10, Channel 13, um, the Democrat and Chronicle, they're not here because you're talking, you're taking a stand on Syria that is quite different than what's handed to us in the media. And Syria is in the news every night. We hear something about Syria. But when someone who has been to Syria and where's Everyone on my delegation has had this experience, so not just me. <coughs> I mean, you know, Jerry Condon, who's the vice president of Vets for Peace, didn't get any news coverage in his community uh, in California. You know, uh, Nobody, you know, uh, uh, people in New York City, of course, didn't get any news coverage. It's a busy place. Um, you know, nobody did. So I, I don't think this is a surprise. They're not going to take someone out. I was thinking about that. I forgot his name now, but um, Tom Hartman and Ed, do you remember his name, Doug? Big Ed? Uh, Schultz. Uh, Schultz. Uh, Schultz. Huh? Ed Schultz. Yes. Political commentator. They're only on Russia Today now. They were on all the mainstream liberal radio, uh, you know, shows uh, at one point. And now they are only on Russia Today. These aren't people who are uh, opposed to the United States. These are patriots and people interested in American politics and, and you know, and into the Constitution and all this stuff. And uh, the only place their shows can be aired now is on Russia Today. Judy, I, I just Googled, because I've never heard of white helmets, sorry, I, I have not. Uh -huh. And it's all positive. They're being I know. called mm -hmm. angels. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if they're not rescuers, what are they? Well, they're members of Al-Qaeda who masquerade as rescuers. Most of them, you can find them in videos of um, Al-Qaeda celebrations of... Uh, you know, victories and stuff, or there's a video, there's videos of them doing rescues that are very polished, and um, you can find, um, I can, at some point, uh, if you want, send you some links, uh, but one of the links that's here is Vanessa Beely's uh, coverage of that, she did a great job. These guys, think about it, $200 million. Think about that. What would... And what would, uh, you know, in a city the size of Rochester, that's 200,000 people, what would our, uh, you know, ambulance and fire corps do with $200 million? You know, uh, hmm. of course, we don't have a war on, but they aren't rebuilding anything. They aren't, you know, uh, doing any, uh, uh, you know, constructive stuff. The hospitals, like I say, some of them still have doctors being paid by the Syrian government, and others are field hospitals and so on. Uh, they, but yes, they're being praised. I mean, to me, it bothers me more that they got the right. What's that called? That award? The right uh, act? Uh, the right? Uh, you know, 
uh, the one that uh, Amy Goodman got and uh, right, some right. other activists got, you know, you know, the Right <laughs> Occupation Award, which is the left, you know, it's it's only given to people that are outside the center of society. I mean, you know, I mean, they probably belong in the in the company of Assad and Kissinger and some of the other people who've got Nobel Peace Prizes. Or not Assad, I mean Obama, excuse me. <laughs> some of the other people who've got Nobel Peace Prizes, Obama, Kissinger, why not the White Helmets, you know? But, um, but to get the, you know, the right activism award, that is really, like, that's scary. And they, um, uh, but I don't know, I think you need to read the, some of the uh, stuff uh, uh, about them. Doug is going to bring me in. Yeah, and... Uh, well, the Blumenthal article, that's good. Yeah, the Blumenthal yeah. article's good, but so are Beely's articles, because she compares them to what else is going on in Syria, because she was with me. Mm -hmm. on the delegation right. and she's like a little more she's a more aggressive person in general than I am so she comes out swinging <laughs> Judy, the, their founder was used to work for Blackwater right <laughs> <laughs> and he's a British army officer yeah and uh, a lot of it works out of the British Foreign Office and right. coordination with AID which agency for international development which has a long sordid history of cooperating with the CIA to, uh, yeah, to they're the soft the hand of the CIA. So it's, yeah. it is a, an astounding, uh, just propaganda and snow mm -hmm. job effort. These are really they they okay. claim that they give decent burials to people, but they have some of their members on film saying that they they throw the the bodies of Syrian government fighters in the trash <clears throat> and they're seen celebrating with weapons which they claim not to have uh, so they're shown yeah. running in at the end of an execution picking up the body and carrying it off <laughs> it's if, like if you did you forget YouTube, to take your uniform off you can find quite a few uh, <laughs> quite a few articles which are actually expose those white helmets yeah, it's very sad. It's a, that that the United the American public is so completely lied to. Um, comment on this quarter? Yeah, yeah just a uh, comment. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, we set up an organization called Gladio in Italy uh, to stem any tendencies toward communism, and uh, they uh, performed some thuggish operations. Uh, and, uh, we send troops in the Greece and stuff. Yeah, we did a lot of, actually at the end of World War II, we went in and made sure there were dictators in some of those countries instead of uh, the uh, uh, governments, the, the popular governments, which were socialist. So, I mean, it's nothing, you know, in a way you could say nothing has changed. We started out uh, killing off the Native American population, and from there we just, you know, I mean, I say we, I don't even know what to say anymore. My relatives didn't get here until in, until the 20th century. So, but you know, it is. It's the whole American thing, and uh, it's sad because immigrants come here so full of hope and so full of uh, believing in all the stuff. And in foreign countries, that's true too. Even in places that are in battle, like Syria, there's a lot of people who still Mao, Mao Zedong. He wanted to be friends with America. Castro reached out to us. And they wanted to, uh, you know, uh, because they like a lot of American culture and American people. And... Um, Ho Chi Minh. Yes. Yeah, Ho Chi Minh, not Mao. I'm sorry. Uh, Vietnam. Mao did too. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, none of them uh, wanted to be enemies with the United States. Uh, that is the United States is my way or the highway. I rule or, you know, I don't have, you know, America doesn't have friends. It has followers. And uh, it could be a very expensive uh, ending for that. So this subject, I hope that all of you will keep thinking about it. I don't know where we're at with time, but I'm thinking we're getting out there. And uh, I just want to say, I hope you'll be aware of this and continue to do some investigation on the internet and take some of these uh, things. Go to my blog because I refer to other places. I don't write constantly, but 
when I have uh, links to things and so on, and uh, and uh, be become aware of what's really happening out there, Doug. I just want to say I'm I'm continually impressed by the breadth of how much you know <laughs> on so many of these subjects. <laughs> Huh? And can remember. Yes, really. but I can't remember my dog's name sometimes. So. No, but, but it, it's very impressive. And, and well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.